Hey everyone, we're back. Um, I've been holding off on this video for quite a while now, <laughs> 10 months really, because the location question right now isn't that clear and might change in the future, but I am I get this question so often that I feel like I kind of have to address it at this point. And I might do an update video if the whole pandemic thing changes things in the future, which it absolutely might then, um, you know, I'm just going to do another video uh, as a follow-up to this one. But I kind of wanted to get this video out of the way because I scripted it out um, earlier this year already because the question popped up so much. And then I didn't do the video because I was like, well, right now, I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, I still don't know what the right answer is, but... So a question I'm being asked a lot is, does location matter? Which often is kind of a backwards way of asking, do I need to be in Los Angeles? And the answer to that is a very vague, it depends. Um, it depends on what you want and how you plan to maximize um, your chances of getting it. For example, library music, you can do that from anywhere pretty much. It doesn't really matter, you can do that from anywhere in the world, you just, you know, write your tracks, feed it into libraries and they get licensed. You know, it, it genuinely doesn't matter from where you do library music unless you have one of those rare in-house positions at a library house and you're like a full-time staff composer. But most library composers are not, they're freelancers. And so you can do this from anywhere because it doesn't necessarily take all that much networking or anything. Um, if you write good tracks, you can, you know, you're probably going to get accepted into a library and then you can just feed tracks into that from wherever you are in the world. If you're a YouTuber and you make m a lot of money with that, um, you know, that can also be done from pretty much anywhere. You don't have to be in a specific location, especially not an expensive location like Los Angeles. But also other branches, if you want to do musicals, I wouldn't say Los Angeles is the, the place to come. Um, you know, it's probably more like Broadway or, you know, London and stuff like that. Uh, there are definitely other places where musicals are much more thriving than Los Angeles. Or if you want to go into games, there isn't really a location where all the game companies, you know, accumulate. There are some hot spots um, around the world but they're not all in Los Angeles. There are some big game companies here in and around Los Angeles, like Riot Games or Blizzard or something like that, but um, there are plenty of game companies in Seattle or um, you know, in, in major European cities. So, you know, it, they're not all accumulated in one spot. So I would say probably then you should go where the games are made that you want to work on. But also if you want to do, you know, French art films, probably go to France, you know? If you want to work on Japanese anime, probably making connections in Japan, probably visiting Japan might be a good idea, you know, where that stuff is made and where that industry is thriving. India has a huge um, movie industry and music industry. There's the whole Bollywood industry. China has a growing market. Um, I don't know if they're already the biggest market in the world for movies, but they will be eventually uh, if they aren't already. So that's a huge market you can tap into. Um, but also, you know, the same applies for Hollywood. If you want to work on Hollywood productions, specifically Hollywood studio films, you should probably come here. And I understand that this is not an option for everyone. Not everyone can just, you know, decide, you know, tomorrow that you know what, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna move to that city. You know, I mean, I'm an immigrant, I'm from Germany, so um, this was a huge thing for me to come to the other side of the planet um, and, you know, kind of start fresh from scratch and, you know, dealing with immigration, which is very difficult actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. This is not necessarily an option. And I was in my, you know, mid twenties when I came over. So this wasn't really, I, I wasn't bound by anything, but I understand that, you know, other people don't have that freedom financially. Other people don't have that freedom family wise. You know, if you already have kids and a partner, this is a big decision to make, um, you know, and other people might be struggling more with immigration. Um, 
you know, any, anything like that, or just, you know, the, not just the cost of the move, but the cost of living in Los Angeles. So there are so many factors that um, play into whether you can do this or not. But um, if you can't move to the city that you need to move to, be it Los Angeles or any other city that, you know, where you think the work is, um, then, you know, take the next closer thing, maybe move closer to the next bigger city or something, you know, where, you know, there will definitely be more events and more things that you can attend, more connections you can make, more work that you, you might get, you know. Um, so take the next best step first, you know. Sometimes you get to the destination with, um, you know, a couple of of side alleys instead of the, you know, straight path. Luckily, these days, we live in a world that is extremely connected through the internet, of course, and international travel has become largely affordable, which wasn't the case, you know, 20, 30 years ago. As I mentioned, I'm from Germany, and then I studied in the Netherlands, because within the European Union, you can just study and live anywhere. Um, and then I came to the United States to study further at UCLA. And then I ended up staying because I was hired, you know, right out of college and then, you know, got a different visa and all that. However, even though I've been in Los Angeles for the past eight years, I have clients from all over the world. I have clients from Germany, I have clients from France, Canada, from the US, but not just Los Angeles, US, but other places as well. Um, I have clients from Mongolia and China, uh, from India and Pakistan. So, you know, I'm obviously not in all of those places, so clearly you can get work from a variety of places without being there physically. However, this is the big but, do keep in mind this is a niche profession. There are probably, what, somewhere around two to three thousand people or something doing this full time and making a living off of it? That's not a lot considering, you know, the world population. So you want to set yourself up for success as much as possible. Even though a lot of my clients aren't necessarily in Los Angeles, probably roughly 90% or more I got as a direct result of being here. I got it because I was either specifically working with someone here, another composer or another director producer, and they recommended me, or they got me the gig somehow, or, um, or that production you know, in Europe was specifically looking for that Hollywood sound, or very often also, um, you know, Chinese productions are looking for a Hollywood sound and they will tap into the Hollywood talent pool. So the importance of being in a well-connected media city really can't be understated. A good 80 to 90% of my career has been recommendation-based so far. And I couldn't have gotten those recommendations without, you know, being here and working with the people that ended up recommending me. Now, I've had some clients that have found me through the internet. They just heard my SoundCloud or they heard library demos that I made or um, they heard my music in a movie or something and, um, or I think found me on YouTube. Who knows? Um, the internet is vast. Um, so it does happen that clients will actually find you through the internet randomly and reach out to you, but um, that's not an everyday thing. Like, that doesn't happen to me, you know, like every week or something. That's, you know, that's not a thing. So while that does happen, it wouldn't be enough to get by on that 5 to 10% of work. Like, I wouldn't be able to do this full time if I just relied on people randomly finding me on the internet or something. I personally decided very early on, you know, in probably my first year of conservatory in the Netherlands or something, that if I was going to do this, I'm going to have to do this, you know, 100% 100 dedicated. I'm going to have to, as the saying goes, you know, if I want to be a fisherman, I got to go where the fish are. And to me, the thing I wanted to do was work on, you know, Hollywood productions on studio production specifically, and I still want that. But so I already decided that very early on, and then um, I basically took any job that I could get. Sometimes I had three jobs next to my studies and would just, you know, kind of try and get together the money to actually come here. But again, this was the situation of someone who obviously grew up in Europe um, with, you know, 
uh, healthcare provided for me and education being provided for me uh, for free, or not for free, through tax money. We keep saying for free. Of course, it's not free. Um, but so there were a lot of costs as a student that I didn't have. And so I could just work on the side and kind of get together the money to come here pretty much. Because this is where I saw um, the most chances to get what I wanted. So how does location actually come into play in reality? Now, while you can find um, work over the internet remotely, I barely know anyone who is hiring people that they haven't, you know, had an in-person meeting with or that, you know, they haven't talked to at length. I mean, we're getting more used to it now during the pandemic, so maybe that will change in the future. But um, so far, my experience has been that people hire people they know, people they've met, people that they've connected with, um, people that in the future they might consider friends and, you know, people they've vetted in person. This goes especially for well-paying gigs or for, you know, the mid-level and higher gigs. You know, they're not just going to, you know, randomly hire a person um, from the other side of the planet that they've never met. And this goes for composers, but also for, you know, producers and, um, you know, directors. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but the general rule, I would say, is that that doesn't really happen. Now, there's one obvious thing. Um, the vast majority of film, TV, and game composers are located in Los Angeles, which is already kind of a clear sign that location, in a way, does matter. I know quite a few composers who would actually, you know, rather live somewhere else, somewhere more affordable and somewhere, you know, less um, densely populated and all that. But, um, you know, they don't dare to leave because they know that if they leave out of sight, out of mind, um, you know, their careers could very quickly just, you know, take a nosedive. Now, if you want to be a studio assistant to one of those people, um, I would say, yes, you probably have to be here because you're going to have to work at their studio, of course. This isn't just to be helpful to them in their workspace, but also for, you know, security reasons. I mean, these studios are usually larger studios that have the, you know, in-house staff members. Um, and so they're handling, um, you know, very confidential material, um, picture material that... Um, you know, they wouldn't just send that to someone um, they don't really know on the other side of the planet. That just doesn't happen. That's way too big of a security risk, and that could destroy, you know, their career. So um, that kind of stuff really just stays on the premises, and then um, anybody who wants to assist really has to come onto the premises. The bigger studios actually even have specific, you know, security requirements that... Um, that a lot of the composer studios or anybody who wants to have the picture material off site, off the studio lot, um, they have to have specific security in place. So really no composer would risk, you know, having material leave the premises, let alone send it to someone they barely know outside of the city or outside of the country. Now, this doesn't mean you can only be an assistant in LA. There are plenty of composers in London, um, I think some are in Berlin, you know, there's there's other places where you can be an assistant. But again, if we're talking about maximizing your chances, you would probably go where the most composers are that are in need of assistance. Because spots are already limited and um, you would need to go to composers that are also working on a specific level of productions because in order to have an in-house staff, that's a very expensive luxury that really only um, composers at a certain level can afford. And so um, those, most of those composers are just here. They just have such an overflow of work that it justifies having that overhead of, you know, a team to make it worth the, the ROI. Because having in-house staff, especially on payroll, is a bit of a financial burden. Another advantage of being in a city that is built around film, TV, and music and entertainment is, of course, that you have so many events and there's so much infrastructure around that. Before the pandemic, there was literally something, or probably multiple things you could do at any given day of the year. 
There were educational events like master classes or um, workshops. There were panels often hosted by something like the Society of Composers and Lyricists. You would have, you know, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC events. You have the Sundance Lab a little north from here at the Skywalker Ranch. You'd have film festivals all the time. You'd have screenings almost every day. There would be some evening screenings with the filmmakers and, you know, stuff like that. You'd have conferences and conventions like NAM in Anaheim, which is, I think, roughly an hour south of here, or, you know, Comic-Con in San Diego, or there's also a Comic-Con Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, it's all like a car's drive like an hour or two away. There's the annual game conferences. Some of them are in Los Angeles, others are in other US locations. There would constantly be um, film and TV related concerts happening, um, very often at the Hollywood Bowl, but also, you know, at Disney Hall or at the UCLA Hall. What is it called? I think Royce Hall. Um, so there would constantly be um, composer events, really specifically, where their music would be performed and um, you could, you know, actually meet the people. There are different talent initiatives by different studios. There are film and music awards you can attend, galas you can attend. Once you've worked a bit, you can also become a member of the different academies and also become a voting member and kind of, you know, go to those events that are related to that. And at all of these events, you can meet just about anyone, be it music executives or agents or managers, publicists, fellow composer colleagues or um, game developers, directors, producers, editors. I mean, really screenwriters, um, music editors, music supervisors, you name it. Anybody, anybody that is working either in your branch or even the other branches, you can meet them at all of these events. I just don't know if there's um, another place on earth where you have constantly have, um, you know, this much talent just pooled together in one location and where you can also just have such a variety of, of opportunities to meet that talent. There's just a certain infrastructure in LA that you will not find anywhere else in the world, I think. And you can, of course, travel to all of these events from outside of LA. But often the important part here is the follow-up. Few people will um, actually, you know, end up collaborating with you because of some two-minute conversation you may have had with them, you know, at some noisy event. But the point of it is you get to meet them, you exchange information, and then you follow up with them and go, what do you say? Maybe we meet for lunch and talk further, more in depth about, you know, your projects or, you know, my music or whatever, really. Get to know each other. Or how about we grab coffee or, you know, anything like that. Um, because the follow-up is really where you truly connect, I think. At least that's how it's happening for me. Um, but I'm also an introvert, so I'm not exactly the social butterfly at an event with hundreds of people walking up to strangers and just being all, you know, <laughs> all impressive or anything. Um, so for me, the thing is really being introduced to someone, exchanging information, and then setting up a proper one-on-one -on -one meeting where you can actually have a proper conversation. But obviously, in order to do that on a regular basis, you would have to, you know, really be here. I mean, I don't I don't really see anybody flying out here, you know, every week or every other day and, you know, kind of doing this because, I mean, that would kind of be a really bad return on investment, I think. And while on the topic of meetings, uh, if you, you know, want to get uh, an agent or manager in Los Angeles, they will want to set up meetings for you with the executives and, you know, developers, you know, anybody really. And most of the people they want to set up meetings with are going to be here. Um, which isn't to say that there aren't Los Angeles-based agents that don't also have clients that are outside of LA. But I think they're going to have a much easier time, you know, selling you when you're actually here and you're flexible and you can just meet people spontaneously when they ask for it. Because these people will want to meet you in person, usually. Uh, again, pandemic might change everything, but so far this was always a um, yes, we want to meet her 
come to our studio you know, on one of these days, at one of these times, please pick one. There are some people who say, well, then I'll just set up all these meetings in one week and then I'll just come to LA for a week and then I'll just have all of them and leave again. That's not really how that works because if these executives or producers or directors are making time for you, you kind of make time for them when they have time for you. <laughs> you know, they have busy schedules. So um, it's already very kind of them to go, all right, let's meet her or him. So, you know, very often you'll, you'll just get, you know, one or two options and then, you know, that's going to be your meeting. And very often meetings get postponed or, you know, even on the day off, they're like, oh man, our previous meeting ran longer. Can we postpone to next week? You know, all this stuff is just very um, flexible and it moves a lot. So... Um, it's really up to the composer to, you know, make it work and be flexible and have time when they have time. So, you know, this whole, I'm just going to set it all up nicely in a schedule that doesn't really work like that. It's usually very fragmented because, you know, meeting a composer they have never worked with, that's not their number one priority, you know? It's, uh, they have other stuff to do. Sometimes my manager sends off a reel and they want a meeting right the week after. And then sometimes my reel goes out and I get a meeting two months later, you know. <laughs> um, so it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really happen in a very structured way. And, you know, it's up to me to accommodate their schedules. And while we're also on the topic of flexibility, um, honestly, I would say on a good 75% of my gigs, there was only probably a 24-hour window between me getting the phone call and me actually having to start. A lot of stuff is very time-sensitive. I know a lot of people who are saying, well, I would like to go to LA, but I first want a job lined up and I first want to be hired and then, you know, come to LA and already have everything set in place. I'm not sure that's a very realistic expectation. Because very often when something opens up, be it either with another composer who needs help or with a director, producer, you know, whoever is calling, um, very often there wouldn't be time to, you know, get you a visa and kind of, you know, have you, you know, pack up all your stuff and then move here, find an apartment, set up your studio. All of that takes a lot of time. And, you know, there just isn't that kind of time. The usual turnaround is really... Um, hey, we're hitting crunch time and we need more people, can you start tomorrow? Or, hey, we fired the composer, um, but the deadline didn't move, can you start, like, when can you start? We needed this yesterday, you know? So a lot of the time, this is just the reality. And then there's, there's no time to, you know, get someone over here. And that's why locals ready to work are often preferred. Um... I just recently had an example. Um, I had just finished uh, the Klaus family and um, I was actually about to take, you know, a good week off and just, uh, it was Saturday morning and, you know, I just really wanted to relax and kind of, you know, recover from uh, the crunch time before that. And I get a call from a producer that I've worked with, you know, on probably 15 different productions already and with whom I will keep working, hopefully forever. And she was like, well, we have a session later, and um, could you jump on to the um, session, you know, listen in remotely and um, help us out? And she called me at around 9 a.m., and I was just making my morning coffee, and she was like, could you be ready to work in five hours? You know, I was like, sure. <laughs> The same thing happened. Um, I remember, you know, one time uh, Steve Shoblonsky's rig went down for some reason, his home rig, and um, I still had the access codes to the studio uh, from when I was helping out with a previous project, and his assistant was um, at home with her family in a different state. So she basically called me and was like, it's Christmas Day, I know, but we need this back up and running, um, could you exchange parts with a duplicate rig and so forth um, and make this rig work again so that he can start tomorrow because he has this big movie coming up and he needs to 
get started right after Christmas. You know, so of course I say yes. Um, and this happens a lot. I remember when I started working for Klaus Badelt um, on Leap. I mean, they literally called me on a Monday and they had me come in, I think, for a meeting and kind of a work in on Tuesday morning. And by Tuesday evening, I already had to submit the first queue. So this is kind of the reality of, of what is happening here. So you can already see that, you know, me being here really already got me all of these opportunities because if I hadn't been here, you know, sometimes I've been on productions and they did want to, they wanted to do a playthrough of the movie, um, you know, on one of the studio lots. And they were like, can you drive over to the studio lot? We want to do a screening and we want someone there who knows the music and who can kind of keep an eye on that while we focus on the other stuff. You know, it's all just so spontaneous. It can it can all go, you know, from nothing at all to everything 24 hours later, or sometimes there are even shorter time frames. Um, also, you know, looking at my own career, so many opportunities just came from being here. Uh, my first job at Cine Samples came from, you know, being here. If I had not been here, I wouldn't have gotten that job. Um, and they were located at Christopher Leonard's studio called Sonic Fuel. They were renting out rooms there. And so from being down there for, you know, roughly two years, Chris knew me. And that's, you know, how he ended up hiring me. And then, you know, after working for him, you know, a lot of recommendations just got me into all these other places. Um, but that could only come to pass because I was here. This would never have happened if I had been in Europe. Also, a lot of good things came out of, you know, those first sample library demos I wrote for Cine Samples because I believe that's how Klaus found me, which is kind of my longest lasting collaboration so far and which has, you know, really jump started my career. But also I couldn't have worked for Klaus if I hadn't been here because, um, you know, he really needed me to come into his studio 24 hours after calling me. So. You know, all of these things just wouldn't have happened the same way. So many opportunities came to me because I was here, I was working, um, supposedly doing an okay job at what I was doing. And so other people were just placing me into other studios and um, more people were finding me. You know, this is also how I got my manager. Um, it was a recommendation from her agency, from another composer that already had known me for five, six, seven years at that time. So often you really need to hang around for, you know, quite a while before people take notice. They often won't give you a shot, you know, right out of the gate. But if you stick around long enough, there will be an emergency or there will be, you know, that moment when they just really need help and you're just the one that's going to give them the help. One meeting often isn't going to do the trick. You have to be on people's radar for longer than that. You have to build a reputation and kind of, you know, build trust with everyone. Build trust within the composer community, within the filmmaker community, uh, with, you know, the people that you work with, with executives. I mean, you know, it's, it's a very, very long journey and you kind of have to be present in people's minds and in their lives um, in order for this to happen. Because the job isn't just writing after all. Um, some people think that if only the right high profile person hears my music, then they're going to be so amazed that they're going to hire me for that, you know, high profile movie or TV show or game. And that's usually not how that happens. You know, the people in hiring positions, they need reassurance. They need to know that you can lead a team, that you can be the head of the music department, which is so much more than just writing music. Of course, there are always exceptions to this. You know, this is just a very kind of broad overview. Um, there are always composers, you know, who aren't located in any of the big media cities and they get their big break. There are these exceptions. There are people who are discovered from the concert world. You know, it's, it happens for sure. Many roads lead to the destination. Um, what this piece is really more about um, is 
maximizing your chances. Because if you take a really long winded road, you might just never get to the destination that you wanted to get to in the first place. So I just probably end this on the cautionary note that you probably shouldn't take the exceptions as the norm. Because again, it's no coincidence that almost all film composers, um, specifically ones that are working on, you know, studio TV shows and studio films, are located in Los Angeles. You can very often directly tie someone's level of success, uh, however you want to define success, to their specific location and what connections they made in that location. It greatly outweighs the opposite situation where the location didn't matter and they still found the success that they set out to get. Um, it's such an exception. It's not impossible. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. And again, the future might look different because pandemic. But um, yeah, this, this journey is already really difficult. Um, it's a very long and stony road to get where you want to get, wherever that may be. So you don't really necessarily need to make it any harder on yourself by, um, you know, putting yourself in a uh, less than optimal position. I hope this was helpful. Um, of course, I made a lot of points for Los Angeles, but um, I hope I also made it clear that depending on what you want, this might not be your location, because um, it's a very expensive location. Um, so, you know, I see being here as a business investment. I, I also kind of like it here. Uh, it's, it's grown on me over time, especially the weather is so nice. Um, but, you know, there's a lot I love about Los Angeles. There's a lot I dislike about Los Angeles. Um, you know, you, you take the good with the bad. Um, and you could probably say that about any location. But overall, um, you know, do a lot of research before you come here because, um, first of all, right now might not be the time to come here because um, it's very hard to make any new connections. Um, the people who already had connections are going to be fine, but if you're brand new to this, maybe now is not the time. Um, but also bear in mind just, you know, how expensive it is to be here and make sure that that's an investment that um, you're willing to make. You're probably going to lose a lot of money coming here and um, it's going to take a long time of, you know, hustling to really be able to make a living here and, you know, to be comfortable um, because I for sure wasn't for several years. Uh, it, it took a while. So, um, you know, just be aware of that. It's, um, you know, come with a starting capital and come with a plan if, if this is really something you want to pursue. Because um, if you don't, it's a very vast city and you might just really get lost in it all. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to being here. Um, do your research before you come here. Uh, 